So welcome everyone to today's session of Gems from the Wisdom Traditions, a conversation circle. And that truly is what we intend for this circle is that it will be a place of rich conversation that people can share from their life experiences, what they've read, what they've absorbed and processed, what's really made a difference in their lives and uh, something that they can share with the rest of us. We always ask somebody to be a, a keynote speaker who will give us sort of a push in the right direction for what we want to focus on for today. That topic is, are we our brothers and sisters keepers? We have someone who is going to speak to us primarily from the Christian mystic tradition. His name is Joe Miller. I am pleased to say that he is a long, long time uh, dear friend of myself and my husband's Cliffs. Uh, Joe and I actually have had a lot of experience with many different traditions. We used to together um, put on an Easter program for children and with children. And we would prepare over maybe six weeks time an Easter play that came from one of a number of different traditions from around the world. And I was uh, reflecting just before this meeting about the, some of the, the traditions that we drew from for these children's plays and they included the um, Hindu tradition, they included the um, cliff dweller tradition of Southwest um, United States, uh, they included the Chinese, perhaps a Confucian or Taoist tradition, and they included South Africa as a, as a place. I don't remember doing one from the mystic uh, Christian tradition. However, I have often heard Joe speak from that point of view. He's a beautiful singer, a choral singer. I've heard him sing in churches many times and uh, beautiful Christian music that he's shared. And he's quite a philosopher. And so he has really a, a beautiful penetrating intellect that is filled with compassion. And I feel that he is so well suited to lead us today in considering this topic of are we our brothers and sisters keepers? Joe Miller. Thank you, Renee, for that generous uh, introduction. Um, yeah, well, um, I wanted to say a uh, a few things that could start your own um, your own thoughts going in your own reflections and um, in the way of a, our having a conversation. Um, I think to start off, I'm really I really like the way that Renee is framing this as gems from the wisdom tradition because it's it, it probably is not that popular in ordinary traditional Christian circles to think about Christianity as a wisdom tradition. And I, th I really believe that that's a, that's a really important standpoint uh, to uh, renew or reform the Christian tradition, I think is to begin to view it in terms of wisdom and in terms of in relation to the other wisdom traditions around the world, rather than the traditional history of the church that tried to represent itself as totally unique, totally separate, and in a contrast to other views that were, you know, demon inspired or whatever. So I think wisdom is the right standpoint. And what do we mean when we talk about wisdom? Well, wisdom is, has to do with that kind of insight, which is able to see the essence of things. Wisdom is able to discern what is truly valuable in life, what is valuable rather than what is merely attractive. Wisdom is able to penetrate what is really excellent, and therefore it's able to identify what is foolish or wrong. Wisdom is able to discern 
what are the, the real problems in human life and what are the real goals. Uh, wisdom discerns the purpose of life. So in that way, wisdom is discerned, we know, from knowledge. Um, wisdom is about the proper use of knowledge with respect to that which is beyond knowledge, which has to do with the heart and soul qualities. Knowledge can find out the incredible forces that bind an atom together. But what, what would wisdom do with that knowledge? You know, would wisdom devise instruments of mass destruction with that knowledge? Probably not. So, so it's really interesting to me to frame this in terms of wisdom. And um, that leads me to uh, you know, a, a few personal stories. I was raised in the Catholic tradition and always felt a devotion to something that was at the core of it that I saw in a few of my elders or teachers or priests. And I wasn't really sure what that was. And there were a lot of contradictory aspects and a lot of, uh, a lot of tumult that the tradition also caused to me. But I was, I was trying to search and ask questions. And uh, that led me eventually to meet people when I was in my early 20s who, were, who framed the Christian tradition in, in respect to the wisdom traditions. And that really opened it up for me a lot. Um, and uh, there was a, um, I'll tell a little, a little, a couple little stories here. When my daughter was five years old, we were visiting my parents and we were, the two of us were having some time hanging out and we, we happened to pick up a book of Renaissance paintings. And uh, as we flipped through the paintings, we came to, a picture of the crucifixion. Now, I, I didn't raise my daughter in a Christian tradition. Um, um, and she had never seen a depiction of this before. And it was quite remarkable to see the effect it had on her. It was quite violent. You know, she, she was absolutely horrified at what she was witnessing there. And she, being in this little earnest soul, she was deeply insistent, you know, Daddy, what, what are they doing to that man? Why would they do that to that man? What, you know? And I was recalling when I was five years old, I was already kind of immune to that kind of feeling. I was, it had been glazed over. It wouldn't have had that effect on me. You know, we, it had been theologized away. We had been told, well, uh, you know, that, um, that uh, you know, that what's happening to him is that um, he's, um, he's dying for your sinfulness, you know, that uh, he's paying the ransom for your depravity. And, um, you know, and I didn't do that with her. I, I instead, I chose to tell her to describe it in a way she could understand that comes from the gospel and not from, not from theology. You know, I told her exactly what the stories tell us, that Jesus was very popular, that he was giving people direct access to their own spirituality and their own empowerment, that it was threatening to the Jewish authorities and the civic authorities both, and that both were trying to find opportunities to kill him. So I, I told him, he, you know, this, this man was, he was a wonderful teacher, an inspiring teacher, but it caused the people in power to feel insecure. They were afraid of him, and in their fear, they did this to him. Um, but he did not hold it against them which is really the remarkable thing about it. Uh, a, few, uh, a few months later, I was on a three-day silent retreat. And, um, and as I walked into the retreat room, it there was no program. I was there to do some specific work, some specific study and writing. But I walked into the room and there was a crucifix on the wall. And, and it, it just kind of bothered me. And it ended up in those, in those three days, rather than working on what I brought, I was instead processing something. Something was released in me by that presence of that crucifix in the room. And I was beginning to see, ah, oh, this, this is unwise. You know, in, in Buddhism, they talk about wisdom and method. This is, this is a fearful image that is, whose propagation provokes fear out of people. Uh, it's a fearful image. And if you really believe in, uh, being a keeper or a trustee of what's in your brothers and sisters, you can't do it through fear. You can't mm -hmm. emotionally bully people and at the same time release in them their own, their own joy, their own insight, 
their own strength, their own adventurousness. You can't do that. And, you know, I suddenly saw it was a bad method. It wasn't wisdom. Whatever it was that decided to represent Jesus's wisdom in that way and propagate it was, was unwise um, and, and was a distraction and actually barred people from reading carefully the Sermon on the Mount or the beautiful passages in John's Gospel. Um, so, uh, and I, let me see, there's an image here I want to share with you. Bear with me here. I hope you can all see that. I, I apologize for the presence of the F word, but I think it has a point. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, that's, that's it, right? It's like, what, if, if the aliens came down and saw a statue of the Buddha in meditation, they would say, oh, here's a culture of deep inwardness. But why do we propagate a figure of a gory, terrible execution? That, that doesn't, you know, if, imagine for a moment, uh, if you were to study, you wanted people to study the subtlety of Gandhi's nonviolent philosophy. And, and who was inspired by Christ through Tolstoy's reading of, of Christ, through uh, Henry David Thoreau, who was uh, inspired by the Gospels. But imagine, would you, would you depict Gandhi at his moment of being shot, bending over his bullet? You know, that statue would do no, be nothing but a distraction. So, so I became interested in wisdom. And if we, if we care about, if we care about, are we our brothers and sisters um, keepers? We, it means, are we the trustees of what is best and finest and noblest in other human beings? And if we are, we want to help each other come to the, in, to the access to the wisdom, to the empowering wisdom that is present in teachings like Jesus. We want to help one another to do that. Therefore, we don't want to act unwisely. We don't want to provoke the sorts of emotional bullying that blocks access to that that probably had other social and political motivations behind it. So this is kind of long-winded, but I wanted to, I, I admired Renee's framing this in terms of wisdom, because I think it brings up a lot of really f important issues to somebody like me who was raised in the tradition and has had to wrestle through these matters, um, and, but has come out on the other side and find in a new and beautiful way I can enjoy and be inspired by the, for example, by the gospel readings or by other uh, mystical texts that have been spin-offs or connected somehow with, uh, with Christianity. Um, the phrase, of course, are we our brothers or sisters keepers comes from the uh, Old Testament uh, book of Genesis. And it is, of course, the story of where Cain kills his brother Abel in the Hebrew mythology. Uh, you know, Cain is connected with animal husbandry and Abel is connected with farming. Um, and as in the, as in the, uh, the musical Oklahoma, you know, can the farmer and the cowhands be friends? Well, in the old, in the old Testament, they weren't. And uh, Cain kills his brother Abel and uh, God who knows this uh, finds Cain and says, um, hmm, have you seen Abel anywhere? And Cain says, what, you know, am I my brother's keeper? Uh, meaning, of course, what have I to do? What have I to do with him? Which, of course, is the voice of our own egotism. And, and, and of course, that sh the shorthand, am I my brother's keeper, am I my brother's and sister's keeper, has, is shorthand for to what degree are we responsible to one another? Um, to what is the meaning of our relationship with each other? How much are we trustees of the physical, moral, ethical, environmental, and spiritual welfare of one another? Um, and all the, you know, all the great human beings have answered in the affirmative, yes, we are our brother's keepers. Uh, yes, we are, we mutually um, are custodians of, of what is best and potential in, within one another. And, and of course, you know, we can even look in um, Jesus's teachings that this is uh, brought out, you know, uh, of course, for example, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus uh, is saying very, uh, uh, very powerful things about our responsibility to one another. 
uh, where he says, for example, you know, um, you know, if, um, you know, uh, resist not evil, he says, um, if, if somebody uh, smites you on the cheek, of course, turn the other cheek. If somebody asks for your cloak, you give him your coat off, you know, also. Um, and these, these sayings are very, you know, have been very challenging. They're very challenging to our egotism. And they've been often represented as well as is Jesus saying that we should do, be a doormat for anybody. Um, but at the same time, these sayings like this have been extremely uh, inspiring for people like, for example, John Lewis, who we just lost this last week. Um, I mean, the whole philosophy of nonviolent resistance is based on a very deep understanding philosophically and psychologically about this very idea of resist not evil. It, it does not mean that one is merely a people pleaser to anyone who is doing anything. Um, in the tradition of nonviolence, what it means is that one openly challenges uh, uh, what, is, what is wrong based impersonally, based on principle, one openly challenges. And yet, and, and as one will receive back the, um, the uh, reaction of, of, of anger or aggression on one's person, one is not to deal aggressively towards the other because that creates a, a pattern of escalation and it causes, it causes it to go further. One instead appeals to the conscience of the other. One believes more in the latent goodness of the other person than one, than, uh, uh, you know, then, then maybe the situation m seems to merit. And therefore, by, by dealing, being open-eyed and dealing, accepting the aggression onto one's person, uh, as John Lewis said, in one's body, putting one's body as a, as a dis disruptor of evil, uh, putting one's body as a disruptor of wrong, awakens the conscience of others. And, and that causes true, um, a, a true reform because, um, uh, uh, you know, in, in Christian philosophy, one should return good for evil, never evil for evil. And of course, one can look in Buddhist teaching and find something very similar too. Um, so, uh, and of course, there's, we can talk about it as in our discussion. There's also remarkable parables that Jesus tells. Um, you know, the ones that come to mind, of course, are the Good Samaritan uh, and also the Prodigal Son, which are stories of extraordinarily, ex the power of forgiveness, the power of non-retaliation, the power of, of self-sacrificing uh, love for others um, and giving. Uh, but I can see that we, I've gone on way too long. So why don't we open the discussion up then? Thank you so much, Joe. Uh, do you have a question for us? Is there something that you're really wondering about this that you weren't able to maybe get to? Uh, I would be interested, well, in a, in a broad way, I would be interested in other people's experiences that may parallel what I said or their reactions. Um, uh, because I don't know what traditions uh, other folks come from. And um, yeah, what, what what do you th what do you think about um, Jesus's philosophy of of turn the other cheek, or resist not evil, or pray for your enemies, um, etc.? Um, you know, we it, we we live in we have been part of a society that has previously, I mean, not so much now, but previously called itself a Christian society, and yet it is the most uh, has been the most violent nation. In, in human history that we know of. How can that be possible if, um, if the uh, Christian tradition was supposed to be that of, of nonviolence? Okay, there you go. That's a pretty good, big question, everybody. Donna. I remember when uh, I first saw the Gandhi movie many, many years ago, how incredibly powerful it was when the salt march took place and uh, uh, volunteers walked up to these uh, security guards or police 
who were holding batons and were striking people down as they walked up. And um, what Gandhi said about that was that it's that at some point their conscience would not allow them to continue that action, and that actually happened. That they, they were able to do this for a while, and then then they couldn't do it. They were ordinary human beings, and they couldn't do it anymore. And, and I remember that just absolutely bowled me over in very minor ways compared to anybody like John Lewis. You know, trying to practice that, sometimes it, you, you get a feeling for the truth of that, that but, but there has to be something in you that, what is it, that trusts in that principle, that allows that to happen? That fellow <laughs> feeling. Is. That whatever it is that makes us feel as if someone is our brother or is our sister, even though we do not share the same biological parents, right? Hmm. That's, it's metaphorical when we say our brother, our sister. There, we only have a few of those in the world, most of us. And yet we're being asked uh, the question of whether we are our brother and sister's keepers in a very, very large context, seeing anyone else in the world as our brother or sister, right? So what kind of... What is that line? kinship? You know, in, the, in the, one of the Gospels, that question of kinship is... Um, answered with the with the um, the parable of the Good Samaritan, um, you know. Uh, I'm going to put up a little a thing here. Um, let me see if I can find it. Uh, so it what happens is there's a. Um, um, I think it's descri he's described as a teacher of the law. He comes up and asks Jesus, "What what is it that I?" that I must do in order to find salvation. Um, and Jesus says, fulfill the law. And he says, he's, uh, and he says, oh, you mean um, uh, uh, love God and, uh, and, you know, love my neighbor. And Jesus says, yes, if you fulfill that, you'll, you will find salvation. And he says, um, he says, how do I, how do I know my neighbor? And then Jesus tells the story, of course, about how, there was a, 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 a man, he's telling this to Jews, so we imagine it's a Jewish man who was on his way over a, a pass, and he's robbed and beaten and, and left for dead. And um, a priest comes over the, the road and sees the man, and, he, and the priest manages to go to the far side of the road and ignore him. And it says a Levite came over, I forget. I don't. I'm not sure what a Levite is. Maybe one of you know. Maybe it's a maybe it's a subtribe within the Jewish community. But he also goes to the far side of the road and ignores him. And then he says a Samaritan comes, and this is really significant socially that he chooses a Samaritan because the Samaritans were despised by the Jews. They were they were as prejudiced against the Samaritans as Southern whites were against blacks. And so Jesus makes the Samaritan the the moral hero of the story. And he says the Samaritan, of course, finds, finds a man, he cares for them, he, he interrupts whatever business he was on, puts him on his donkey, takes him to an inn, spends his own money to rehabilitate the man, tells the innkeeper, spend whatever there it is that you need to, and on my return, I'll pay for that as well. And Jesus says, uh, he's, Jesus asks the man, he said, which of the three was acting neighborly? And he says, the one who was merciful. And Jesus says, act that way. I think one of my questions to myself is, when am I ever doing enough? We have a family on this island right now who um, is a, a very large family to begin with. The, the wife of the family is one of 11, 12, or 13 children. Many of them still live at the same house where she lives. And she has managed to have land um, put under her trusteeship immediately behind her house. 
uh, many acres of land. And so she has invited an entire homeless community to come onto that land. She's found ways to have um, small, tiny homes made for them. Some of them are still in tents. And she set up kitchens for them, showers, um, is making sure that um, food is being donated, working uh, to get the proper kinds of counseling for them, uh, working to see that they are able to find jobs, etc. And absolutely treats the people in this, this little village now behind her house as if they are part of her family, mm -hmm. as do the rest of the members of her family. It's, it's so astounding mm -hmm. to see a real-life example of somebody doing this. I mean, taking people who um, have their issues with drugs and, um, and alcohol, although there are rules about not doing that there, um, it, it's, it's no doubt still an issue. Um, she has several people who are in stage four cancer, um, people with children. Uh, it, it's just remarkable what she and her family are doing. That's a really, really high example, right? I, I, I don't think that we're all called upon to do that. I think she's in special circumstances. She's trained herself. She and her husband took in, I don't know, uh, many, many, many uh, foster children, adoptive children. They have cultivated a whole way of life that's so welcoming and taking care of others. I think others of us have different duties in the world, but it certainly causes me to ask, when am I doing enough to keep my brother and sister? Do you think they, uh, she visualized this in advance, or do you think it started by one little thread, one little helping of somebody who came her way in her life and then that grew to something else and grew to something else. I mean, we look at the whole thing right now, but do you think, do you think she visualized something so extensive at, at first? That's a great question. I, I don't know the answer. That would be a good question to ask her. Um, I imagine when she saw the need to, um, and, and she's a uh, very ardent practicing Christian, by the way, um, when she saw the need for um, these children to have proper care and she offered her roof for them to stay under. Maybe she didn't have this larger picture in mind yet. Yeah, I think we often hear stories about, you know, what, we want to do something big for the world and then we start thinking about the world and ignoring what's at our feet or what's before us. But it seems like stories like that always point to somebody responding to someone in in their own unique situation, they, they could do something practical for someone right near by, right near at hand. And then it becomes like, you know, I don't know, I think of it as spiritual gravitation or something where, where two or more are gathered, the, it becomes a focal point for other, other forces to come. And, uh, and it, it can grow and, and multiply. Yeah, thank you. That's really helpful. Actually, Alice, you have um, an experience along those lines now that I think of it. You mentioned something along those lines. Um, yeah, I just, um, I took in a homeless family. I had a uh, space that no one was using. It was a family that was known to the medical school. So it was someone um, they knew well. And they had a little three-year-old daughter and they were living out in the streets um, in Kakaako. And to me, just the thought of having this space that I wasn't using and there's this little girl living on the street. And since the family was known and you know they didn't have any drug problems, basically what happened was they lived paycheck to paycheck and the dad had a, a heart attack and that caused them to be on the street. 
Um, so took them in. Basically, the deal is is that they take care of the house, or take care of the, their area, and the front part of the house as if it's their own, and they do, and to help protect the house. And they've been here for about five years now, so almost six, because little girl was three when she moved in, and she just turned nine. So yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. I have a you question. mentioned that that did not feel natural to you at the beginning. Well, I mean, it kind of, it wasn't that it didn't feel, it was like the push to do it came from some place I couldn't explain. Um, I don't know why. It's not something that I would do or I would see myself doing. Um, I'm very much an introvert. The thought of someone else kind of living on my property that I didn't know just wouldn't be something I would normally do, but I, I felt this weird push. I couldn't explain where it came from, and it kept pushing at me, and oddly enough, my husband agreed with me, which I would have thought he wouldn't have either, but he said yes, and um, so there we are. <laughs> Amazing. Well, that uh, kind of reinforces Joe's point about, uh, you know, something that arises naturally uh, in your own sphere and that you see a need that you can fulfill and you, you take action to fulfill it, you know. So it's not as though you're going out and trying to be a good person, but you, you're, you felt empathy and acted on it. So that's a, that's a wonderful example, I think. I, I, um, I wanted to respond to uh, Joe's question and then raise another question and put Joe on the spot. Because uh, I've also known Joe for a very long time and I know how uh, astute he is and a deep thinker. Um, <clears throat> so Joe mentioned this, you know, why, why have we, uh, uh, why, why do we live in the midst of a nation and, and a culture that is violent in so many ways. And we call, we think of ourselves as a Christian nation uh, often, um, but in fact, we seem to be acting, uh, you know, whether that's in, in business, in politics, in our relations with other countries in a, in a, uh, in a violent way. And even our, our justice system, for example, um, is based on the idea of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, uh, which is the old Mosaic law. It's the Old Testament law. Um, so in, in some ways, it, we are based, we are a Christian nation because we're, it, our, our fundamental belief system is based on that Old, old Testament uh, belief. Um, but um, I noticed in, uh, <clears throat> in, Renee's, I don't know sure if it was Renee's or your description of uh, our discussion today was mystic Christianity. And I'm just wondering if you could kind of help us um, understand the distinction between mystic Christianity as opposed to may, maybe more orthodox uh, or dogmatic or rigid forms of Christianity, or maybe Christianity based on the Old Testament as opposed to the New Testament. But in very broadly, how would you, how would you um, define or help us, uh, help us define what's meant by mystic Christianity? Uh, um, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not a, um, I'm not very versed on Christian history, um, but there, um, there's a saying in, um, in Thomas's gospel. So, right, there's the, the Nag Hammadi find of these Gnostic texts, and there's a gospel according to Thomas. Um, but one of the sayings, uh, and they're, they're not, it's not a narrative, it's not a narrative gospel like the canonical gospels. It doesn't have a story. It's just a, a group of sayings that are attributed to Jesus. And, and actually about half of those sayings are in the canonical gospels. Uh, but there is one saying where uh, Jesus says, uh, I have come to set a fire to the earth and I will rekindle it until it blazes, something like that. Um, and so I, th I think you find uh, 
despite the uh, theological uh, contrivances that have been built up and you know transparently used for social control or political reasons, um, that that there have been there is this seems to be this authentic impulse that runs underground and it blossoms again and again in uh, uh, over the centuries in different groups um, and. Uh, and who knows, we know a few of these, but it probably prevails, you know, and even, even within the traditional church, there are remarkable people in the, in the Episcopal Church and the Roman Catholic, Catholic Church, who, um, philosophers and mystics. So, you know, what is it? Well, what is a mystic? Um, well, then you're putting, it, you're putting it in the context of the wisdom traditions. Um, you know, mysticism implies somebody who is having direct experience. Somebody who the the there something is being released, light is being released within them, um, something that is uh, that is directly spiritually nourishing, uh, an actual energy that um, that in this case they would find connected through whatever was flowing through Jesus, uh, whatever whatever his particular impulse is. Um, that it would be connected with that. In John's gospel, Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Uh, you know, the, I live in you and you live in me like the branch and the vine are connected. Um, so there, that's, you know, there's a mystical meaning to that saying. It's, it isn't just a metaphor for people who have this sort of experience and who do become devoted to the tradition in this way. And many of them try to be reformers as well as, you know, Meister Eckhart or Francis of Assisi um, so, uh, you know, and, th and that's the thing of, you know, again and again, the impulse is that of reform. I mean, Jesus himself was a Jewish reformer and reformers know that they're coming from principle. They're coming from something within. And like John Lewis says, they're trying to, they're trying to interrupt. They're there to interrupt, uh, injustice and to provoke a slumber, to provoke, um, inertia and, con and mere conventionality. You know, they're like, it's like Socrates. Socrates said he was a, the gadfly of Athens and any irritating gadfly is eventually going to be swatted by the horse's tail and killed. So all these reformers, whether you're speaking of Jesus or Martin Luther King um, or Gandhi, they, they are putting themselves, their bodily in the in, completely 100% con, uh, con, committed to this reform. And they know that there will be a reaction upon what they're doing which will probably overcome their, their bodily life. Um, but where does that impulse come from? Well, I mean, for me, that's what I think of by mysticism. It is, it is direct insight. It's somehow the person has done the inner work so that they're attuned uh, to that direct impulse. So in other words, you feel as if they are so attuned that they no longer feel the need to heed external um, authority, even within their tradition. Yes, that's a, a good way to put it, Renee, that where does the real authority come from? It, it has to come from within. It has to come from truth. And, uh, you know, at the end of, um, you know, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, which is that major speech that comes at the very beginning of the Gospels and Matthew's Gospel, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, which takes up three three chapters, it says that the the people were astonished when he stopped speaking. The people were astonished because he spoke with authority, unlike the teachers of the law. So there's something self-evident. Something he was awakening something in them that was different than mere giving of doctrine or the mere pushing of the law. You know? and, and of course, if you read with that in mind, the gospel stories are full of that. I mean, it's it's going, you see, he's always pushing the limit. He's pushing, he's pushing the line. And uh, you know, and, and his and of course the, his teaching of mercy is so powerful. There's a there is um, a couple. A couple times in Matthew's gospel, there are these scenes in the, uh, there are these scenes where he is with his disciples and they're doing something like maybe they're, they're hungry on Sunday and they're breaking off 
wheat berries and chewing on them. And then they're accosted by the, uh, by the priests or the, the Jewish authorities for you know, breaking the Sabbath. Well, it was probably on a Saturday then, sorry, Jewish Sabbath. And, you know, and what he says in both of these instances, he, he quotes an Old Testament prophet. And he says, he says, go back to your books and learn what this means. I want mercy, not sacrifice. And it's like, well, what does that mean? Why does he say that to them? And if you go and you look up that, that reference, these are, there's a whole bunch of these references in several of the Old Testament pro prophets where God is saying, I don't want your ritualism. I don't want your animal sacrifices. I don't want your empty prayers. I want you to care for the widows. I want you to help the poor. So there are several of these Old Testament passages, and this, this passage is one of those. And it's curious that he quotes that, because his disciples are just in the field picking these wheat berries. They're not, they're not, there is no, there's no ritual. There's what's going on. So what is the meaning of that? Well, he's, he's using a metaphor there. He's saying anytime that we are uh, unfairly criticizing others, anytime that, you know, we're jumping on as fault finders, we're trying to justify our egos at the expense of someone else. We're, we're trying to sacrifice them and their self-respect and their image in order for us to gain something. And it's, and that's like, that's like a, a scapegoat in a ritual. That's like taking an animal sacrifice, trying to find one's purification by killing an animal and offering it to God. Um, so anyway, it's, it's psychologically brilliant. Um, but that's, you know, some of the insight going on there. Mary. His name is Mary for a reason. <laughs> who has um, spoken to us uh, very beautifully, in fact, on the tradition of Mother Mary. Mm. And I wonder what you might have to say to this idea of direct knowing um, that, that might be referred to as someone who is truly, really connected with with. God, as they perceive that to be, and also with mercy. Thank you. Um, regarding self-knowing, I know that I rely on the Holy Spirit. I do not know anything on my own. I receive little hints. I don't, I don't have visions, but um, I will just get like... It's okay. Um, one time I, I received the message, rest in me. Um, so it'll come to us in the quiet. Um, it'll come to us when we need it. And if we call out to our higher power, in my case, it's, it's either Jesus, the Blessed Mother, my guardian angel, um, the Holy Spirit, God, God the Father, and if I listen, I'll get a message. Whether or not I choose to follow through with that, um, it's my choice. And that's the biggest thing that people might not understand about the Catholic God is he would never force himself on any person. We are all given free choice. And what we do with our choice is our gift back to God. Um, when I was listening to Donna talk, I was thinking about the seed because we plant a seed and it grows. It's like a thought, you know, it gets bigger and that's what your still and moving center was, right, Renee? It was just a little seed. It was a little thought and how it has blossomed and grown and touched so many across across the world, around the world. And so I, I'm very blessed to be part of this wonderful family of the Still and Moving Center. Um, I wanted to also just say from Joel, your description of the crucified Jesus's 
not unusual. I don't, I'm a Bible um, read, cradle Catholic. I was baptized, raised in the faith. I've always had crucifixes around. I've had, um, I've never thought of them as gory. I will say though that the cruci um, the Passion of the Christ by uh, Mel Gibson was the most, well, that was, that was, um, it was very graphic. And I was very glad that I saw it. I will probably never see it again. And then um, when I was in, living in Kailua, at, um, I would attend St. Anthony's of Padua in Kailua. And we had a speaker came and he talked about the crucifixion. And I had never known, you know, what the background, what the torture was. And, and he, was, he was very um, direct about the suffering that went on. And I have always felt, I've always believed that it's our sins that actually caused the crucifixion. And that's what I have been taught. Um, I also, when, you, when we talk about um, our brothers and sisters about um, John Lewis, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, all of those people who tried and professed their mercy, professed nonviolence. I embrace the cross. I, I just want to hold Jesus because from him, I will be shown what to do for my family, for the world, for the community. And that's something that I, I do embrace. I, I love the cross because that's God's love. He sacrificed his son. And, you know, any of us who have children, we wouldn't want anything bad happening to our children. And, but I, I believe in life with the Holy Spirit, with God the Father, Jesus, Blessed Mary, angels, and all the saints. You know, I'll get there, and I'll try to help as many others to get there as I can. Amen. <laughs> so when I hear you um, speak of it, Mary, um, the, the cross, that is, I'm hearing something like there's the story of Prometheus that we got to hear at, who went ahead and stole fire from the gods even though he was warned by Zeus not to do it. He brought fire down to humanity and he suffered terrible consequences for having done that. And he knew that he was going to suffer those consequences, and he did it anyway, out of his love for humanity. And so what I'm hearing you say is that sacrifice, um, not only, no doubt, of God sacrificing his son, but of Jesus sacrificing his own life, um, no doubt aware of the risks of uh, what he was preaching, um, that to you inspires uh, your gratitude and perhaps even your courage and your willingness to do for others even, you know, to your own detriment, so it would seem. Um, I happen to know uh, about Mary that uh, she lives in a lovely little three-bedroom home uh, which she, as uh, almost as long as I've known her um, she has shared with a, a quite large number of people um, uh, several generations of her family have uh, moved in and out she often um, has her adoptive daughter's daughter and granddaughter there um, sometimes with a partner and um, 
her daughter Malia, who's the, our hula teacher at Still and Moving Center, uh, may come over with her three kids. And besides that, um, there was a, a student of, at Still and Moving Center who was taking our hula classes who ended up couch surfing with her five children. And Mary took all of them in. And they continue to be there, um, I think, every other week. Um, and this has probably been about seven years or so. Um, so I know that she does her best <laughs> to live a life that does involve some sacrifice. It's probably not as comfortable in that house <laughs> or as quiet as she might like it. Um, so no. am, I, yes. <laughs> am I reading your, the reason that the, that cross means something to you? Oh, that's, that's definitely part of it. Yeah, it's kind of tough with a three bedroom, one and a half bath house. And yep, at times we've got at least, you know, nine to 10 people in here. And yeah, every other, every other week we've got a full house, but um Two of the kids now stay with us because one graduated from high school. And so there are actually just two others that go back and forth because one of the one of the sons decided to stay with his father in Eva Beach. So it's been it's been lively. <laughs> and no, it's um I was thinking um of the cross because Jesus does say, pick up your cross and follow me. And so I <laughs> I, I have to remind myself that it's, it's all for the greater glory of God and, and my reward is going to be in heaven. So I'm going to have a really clean house with lots of nice furniture and no broken dishes, but I'm not worried about it. I'll get it. Amen. <laughs> what a sacrifice. And I guess, you know, I think if, you have this inner calling and your mind is on the spirit you don't have that paralyzing fear especially because your mind's not always on the body or bodily comfort or security um but what amazing sacrifice uh, he made and and it went beyond ethnic group it went and it's so universal it really went beyond any one religion anyway, but he was Father Damien. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Maybe others know a lot more than I do about it, but it was wonderful. It definitely involves sacrifice. He, in the end, caught Hansen's disease, leprosy, and, and perished from it. But how many people he served uh, before that time? And what recognition he brought to their plight um, through his own service. Yes. Yeah, and he went beyond appearances because leprosy is kind of not really such a nice thing to look at. Mm. But he went beyond appearances. He saw something about human beings that weren't just the, their appearances uh, and still made the sacrifice like he just pointed out. I, I wanted to return to something that um, uh, Mary said, I'm, uh, where she was speaking about the um, the presence of the Holy Spirit, and um, you know, there's a line that Paul Paul says, "Not I, but Christ in me." And I think returning to Kirk's question about Christian mysticism, that would be it would be very much connected with that, with a sense that the the personality or the personal ego. Um, is 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 a is the false self. Um, there's a a great Catholic writer Thomas Merton who uh, certainly one would call a mystic. You know, and he um, he, he wrote in the 50s and 60s especially, um, but he wrote lucidly about this that there, you know, um, in I would say in Christian mysticism, um, you know, Christ was not Jesus was the um, Jesus was the epitome or expressed the Christ in its fullness. And, and yet the Christ or the son of God is within each one of us. And we, most of us are imperfect. We are expressing it imperfectly. There are compromises with our egotism and our ignorance. 
Um, but the, so in the path of the Christian path, as I understand it, it involves a self surrender and a growing consciousness of the Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of wisdom within us. Uh, holy, the word is connected with the word whole. It's not partial, it's, it's complete and, and also pure or innocent. So it's this discovery, this invitation, this self-surrender of our, um, of, uh, our limited self-conceptions, of our prejudices, of our small-mindedness, to this uh, growing consciousness of this um, spirit of wholeness within us, this, this voice for truth, this voice for God, uh, and letting it lead the way. And indeed, I think Mary said it very eloquently, there, one can experience uh, spe very specific suggestions. Uh, one can feel its prodding, um, but especially its training of the mind, uh, where one learns the discipline of letting go of separative thinking, of negative thinking, um, and bringing one's mind back to, to fundamental principles and truths. I, I wanted to show, show one more picture here. When I, um, the church I, I grew up in, um, which was in the, near Los Angeles, St. Bernadine's, they did a, they redid the church and, um, in the early 2000s. And it's unique, they chose as a centerpiece, instead of a, um, instead of a crucifix, they chose in the, as a centerpiece what was an, kind of an Eastern Orthodox icon. And you can see that there to this day. It's called Christ Pentecrator, which is Christ the teacher of wisdom. And so there's a very living Christ uh, with a holding a mudra, uh, a um, symbol of his hand that reminds one of Buddhism, and then holding the scripture with his, um, on his knee and uh, enunciating uh, the word, you know. And of course, that's a very vivid metaphor in the Gospels. Um, again and again, it says he, he opened his mouth and spoke to them. And they were, made, they were made clean by his word. They were made clear by his word. As, as my story tells you, a little different than Mary's inspiration, but I was quite encouraged <laughs> by that <laughs> altarpiece. Can, Renee, can I read a passage from your, the Almanac, the Still and Moving Almanac? Um, this is, from, this is for this coming Tuesday from Harriet Beecher Stowe. I am speaking now of the highest duty we owe our friends, the noblest, the most sacred, that of keeping their own nobleness, goodness, pure and incorrupt. If we let our friend become cold and selfish and exacting without remonstrance, we are no true lover and no true friend. Thank you, Renee, for hosting this gathering. Um, thanks for all of you coming out here uh, for this. It was very interesting. And I, I appreciate your reflections, all of you. Yes, we appreciate yours so much, Joe. We know that um, you are a true thinker, an explorer, someone who doesn't take things at face value or for granted. And you're always seeking, and you're always seeking new understanding deeper understanding, and better ways to connect with and do for your fellow human beings. And really, really appreciate your joining us and sharing that with all of us. Thank you for the invitation, Renee.